Dr. Fish, theoretical physics, maximizing the number of ways particles can be distributed in various energy levels. And by maximizing omega, I will maximize log of omega since it'll be easier. And when I write this out in terms of uh, the logs and using Stirling's approximation, I get this form that we derived in an earlier section. The total number of particles in each of the various energy levels equals a capital N, which is constant. That's one constraint. And the total energy is also a constraint. We proceed with doing our max problem by taking the differential of log of omega, set it equal to zero, and all these partials with the uh, variables. It would be nice if all the variables here happen to be independent because then we could use the argument that since they're independent, the coefficients, all the partials in front, must be equal to zero. However, two are dependent because you have two equations here. You can solve for two of the unknowns, the n1s, two, n1, 2, and 3. ni's are the unknowns here. When you solve for two, then two of these variables are not free, are, are fixed. So if we look at um, the situation here, under term multipliers will come to the rescue. Uh, capital N is a constant, so d capital N is equal to zero and D capital E is equal to zero because energy is constant. Well, we will use the trick we did earlier with under term multipliers where we take say zero minus zero equals zero and we did that with the X and the Y uh, analysis for the area. Here we have uh, two constraints so we'll take zero minus alpha zero, you know, alpha times is zero minus beta times zero. And the trick there, you might say, that doesn't make any sense. Why are you doing that? Well, here's why. Because when you get to this thing, it looks really nice now. Because when you take these partials and pull out the DNI, that's really what, where you want to get to. Then if these DNIs are independent, then each of these, uh, in parentheses here, term by term, you know, I by I must be zero. And then you would write down this for each of the I's individually. So this applies for I equal one, I equal two, I equal three. However, the DNI's are not arbitrary because two of the NI's are fixed. So what we do, if you recall the trick with the under term multipliers, is you pick alpha so that that one that's dependent this will be this this will kill it alpha will make it so so that it gets killed and since we have two of them we have to have two undetermined multipliers so for the dni's that are independent this is then zero using the independent argument for the two of these that happen to be dependent i pick alpha and beta to kill those off now the beauty of this if you recall from our previous example with the area the same form is true the partial with respect to x before and the partial with respect to y had the same form equal to zero. So the partials here with respect to the, our variables n1, then 2, and 3, and 4 are going to have the same form. Uh, what replaces our x here, n1, n2, n3, n4, and 4, and what replaces the y, the dependent variable, would be two of the n's. Well, those two n's are taken care of by picking alpha and beta out you pick you have two of these to pick so you can then kill two and then you have the same form for the independent and also the dependent variables that's the beauty of the method of undetermined multipliers if you're still a little hazy about this go back and do, see that area problem again that area problem has all of the fundamental elements of the Lagrange undetermined multipliers using just one variable x that's independent and one variable y that's dependent. Here you have all the ni's as independent except two of them but the same principle applies. Then we calculate. We calculate here the partial derivative with respect to n1 here and we notice that we only have to worry about the first two terms here because the first term has n1's camouflaged in there. I mean n1 plus n2 is in here, n1 plus n2 plus n3 is in here. Uh, here you have n1 explicitly shown and here there's no n1's, no n1's from here on to the right so the partial derivative of all this stuff to the right with respect to n1 is zero. It's gone. So we need to just worry about these two terms and let's do the first one here. 
where we'll use the chain rule. It'll take the partial with respect to capital N and then the derivative of capital N with respect to N1. So that leads us to the product rule, which we'll use next. The derivative of first is 1 times the second log of capital N plus N times the derivative of the second, 1 over N. N over N gives 1. And the partial of N, capital N with respect to N1, is simply 1 because big N is equal to N1 plus N2 plus N3. So you get your 1. And that gets you this nice result that the log of N capital N plus 1 is your result. And then for the second piece here, which we will subtract from this one, the second piece is easy because it has N1, N1, and N1 in the three places with that log in there. Here it is. N1, N1, N1. See what that log. You take the uh, derivative of the first, which is 1 times the second, log of N1, uh, plus N1 times the derivative of the second, 1 over N1, gives you the 1. Very nice. Similar result. And here, when we uh, subtract the lower one from the top one, which is what we have to do here, see, we'll put the top one here first, and then we're going to uh, subtract from that one the low, the, the second one here, which will be over here. Notice that the ones cancel, get this nice result, log of capital N is minus the log of N1, and when we go to our equation here, we have done the first partial derivative, and there's a partial derivative involved here in this middle piece, but we've already done that, and here you can see easily why it's 1 again, the partial of capital N with respect to N1 is going to just simply be a 1. And the partial of E with respect to N1 pulls off the epsilon 1. So you get epsilon 1. So let's write all these results on the summary page here. We have the summary. And we're going to put them together piece by piece. And we'll do that in this next line here. So the first partial derivative is log of capital N minus log of N1, there it is, minus alpha, and this partial derivative is 1, goes right there with the alpha of 1, minus beta, this partial derivative is epsilon sub 1. We get that far, we go from uh, there to this next line which brings log of N1 to the other side of the equation and subtract log of capital N and then just write these first here and on the other side equation is minus alpha minus beta epsilon 1 and that gives us the log of the ratio and 1 over capital N and if we exponentiate both sides of the equation or simply write n 1 over capital N is equal to then the exponential e to the minus alpha minus beta epsilon 1 and then we can bring the n, big N, over to the right side. And since this uh, can be done for all the n's, and 1, and 2, and 3, and 4, we'll simply say n sub i, the general case, is equal to here capital N e to the minus alpha minus beta epsilon sub i. A very nice result because this is the total number of particles and it gets reduced when it gets hit by this exponential. It gets reduced so the number of particles in the ith energy level is going to be less than a capital N, and this tells us that. What has to be done next is we have to determine what alpha and beta are.